Let's pray, and we'll start our live Q&A today. Father, we just thank you for this. Uh, I thank you for this time, Lord. I thank you for all these people who are here. I pray, Lord, that most importantly, the questions that were asked, that are asked, that we will deal with today, I pray our hearts will be prepared for those things. I pray the hearts of those asking for every sincere heart, Lord, I pray the answers would draw them to you. And even, Lord, who, those who might be skeptical or might be investigating faith, I pray that your Holy Spirit would also anoint the questions and bring them, uh, bring them to all of us, Lord, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. By the way, thank you for all the greetings on my birthday. I have a bit of a dilemma because I grew up in a family where we who had a birthday were not allowed to do anything about it. You know, like we, we know it's our birthday, but we just kind of like, oh, it's just another day. And, and then maybe somewhere along the day, everybody would say happy birthday or maybe sing happy birthday. And then that's it. And I married into a family where birthdays are really important. And I've struggled with it for two reasons. Number one, I'm not very good at planning my wife's birthday. And, and you know, I'll, I'll admit it. And the Lord convicted me of it a couple of years ago, and I'm working on it. But it's, it's, just, it's just not what I grew up doing. And, and number two, I'm also a little bit embarrassed when everybody remembers it's my birthday because that was the way I was raised. So I've decided I'm going to be a better birthdayer for my wife. Oh, I forgot. Oh, no, I'm sorry. I was supposed to book a reservation that only opened up at 9 o'clock this morning, and I missed it. I guess we're not going to that restaurant, babe. <laughs> anyway, but anyway, I'll try and work my way around it. But, but secondly, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to embrace, thank you. Thank you for all your kind words and everything else. I'm 68. If I'm not careful, in a few years, I'll be old. Okay, let's go to the questions. <laughs> A pastor who's leading a ministry here is not an AOG, Indo-USA credential, or has any theological background. Does it mean anybody can be a pastor here? You know, I sent out a note to our department heads, and I said, oh, there's a question about this. Who are we talking about? And while I was sitting over there, Josh kind of snuck up and said, I think it's me. And uh, I, I'm looking at it, because Josh is the only one that we call pastor who would fit that credential. Let me, let me say that I want everybody to understand. First of all, the term pastor means shepherd. And we actually have people on our staff who are credentialed and have theological training that we don't call pastor. And the reason we don't call them pastor is because we don't, they, they don't particularly want that title. Josh, Josh is credential as a pastor. And not only that, by the way, he's also part-time working for the church. So he's only a part-time employee of the church. And the reason we call him pastor is because he is. He's a pastor for the teenagers. The, the experience that he has, his whole life has been in IES. If you look back to our very first Christmas thing, Josh was Herod. If you look back further back, I think you might have been a... Yeah, anyway, he, he's, he's, he's been a part of IES all along. He has clearly gained the capability to be recognized for what he is. And the teenagers all call him the German shepherd. So, I mean, if somebody's called a shepherd by their flock, uh, obviously he fits in. Great question. Uh, Christine, who's handling the kids, does not use the title kids pastor. But she has a graduate degree in psychology, and she's also 20 years in IES. And so, you know, it would be very clear that we could use that title here, there. But she doesn't want it to be used because sometimes parents misunderstand what it means. Department or uh, the head of the department, people can kind of understand that. So, um, But we use pastor as a title, first of all. If a person has a credential that entitles them to be called pastor, we're happy to call them pastor. And, and if they have an educational requirement or something like that, we're happy to call them pastor. But that's not all, all is into it. Years and years and years ago, when my wife and I were working with another church, there was a guy in the church who was an architect, who was a musician. And, um, and, and we, in fact, I remember very well when we first time we forced him to lead worship while he played the keyboard, and he wasn't real happy with that. And, uh, and his background was in architecture. And uh, we, I used to always say to him, when are you going to quit working for money and start working for Jesus? And finally, one day in frustration, he said to me, why don't you make me an offer? And so I, I, we planned that the English department of that particular church would hire him on a ministry staff as a, as, a, as a worshiper, as a leader of worship. And I was shocked to be told, oh, no, he can't. He can't be a pastor because he never went to Bible school. I thought that was a really strange rule. Now, I understand credentialing and all those processes, and I understand balance. If you come to me and say, well, I want to be called pastor whatever, I'm not going to necessarily call you pastor whatever. But pastoring is about ministry and calling, not about anything else. Yeah. And, and whoever asked that question, if it's not Josh, 
be more specific to me, okay? You can send me a note. Congratulations, Josh. So you get to be the opening question. All right, let's go. As a Christian, what is your view on conceiving through IVF? Wow, that's a really good question. All right. So the real issue of, of IVF is what happens to the uh, embryos that are successfully reproducing that are then frozen for later implantation, okay? I have my opinion on that. I cannot base my opinion on that on text. So I will never say to you, this is what the Bible says. Because the Bible doesn't deal with this issue. It clearly doesn't deal with this issue, all right? I believe that every couple who chooses to use IVF needs to sit down and honestly look at that question, all right? So I've had, I've had couples who have used IVF and they've said to me, you know, Pastor Dave, what we thought about it is every embryo that's viable that we get, we will, we will implant it and we will, if we end up with a lot of children, we're okay with a lot of children. And, I be, and the others have told me that they don't believe that the embryos are in fact uh, need, to be, uh, need to be treated as, as children. That is a decision that people need to make for themselves. All right? There's no scriptural evidence that says one is right and one is wrong. However, there are, there are a group of people that I highly respect in America who actually petition and seek to find families that have now had the children they want through IVF, and then those families have remaining uh, embryos that have been considered viable that are frozen. And they will take those embryos and implant it themselves. And they will take those children, and they say it's just another way of adopting a child. And I have huge respect for that, okay? So it's a complicated issue. It's, it, you cannot, you know, I know people tell you, well, the Bible says this and this. Well, the Bible says a lot of things, you know? Uh, you know, it, 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 the Bible, a lot of people quote the, uh, I, you knew me when I was knit together in my, in my mother's womb. Actually, it's talking about knowing you before you were knit together in your mother's womb. And so that issue, if you want to quote it, you need, you need to quote it accurately. Great question. I know that it's unfortunately become a very big political issue. In my opinion, when my wife and I spent a number of years wondering whether we would have a child, IVF was out there as a, as a possibility. Uh, it is something we chose not to do, but it is out there as a possibility. I think anything medically done that can help a family who would want to have children is a good thing that needs to be examined. So IVF, look at it carefully. The issue is primarily, in my opinion, what do you do with viable embryos that are that when you decide you don't want any more kids? And I, I think that's, that's, a, that's a really important question for every couple to decide before they go down that path. But I don't, I don't think there's a biblical, clear biblical or clear moral issue on it. So good, good, good question. I think helping people have children is a good thing. Okay, thank you. In a Christian's marriage, how is a husband's role determined? although the wife is working and have her own money. Ah, boy, oh boy. Okay, so let's understand the things that we would want to filter through from the way the Bible described how marriage was. Understand that about the Bible, and especially in the New Testament and on the Old Testament, was way more progressive and valued women, much more than society around it did, okay? And then we understand Paul talks about in, in the book of Ephesians chapter 5, way back there, and I think it's verse 21, and you can know, I'd have very few memories, scriptures memorized by number, but I have to have these memorized because so many people abuse them. And in that passage, he says, submit yourself one to another out of reverence of Christ. So in a marriage, the husbands and wives submit to each other, but they submit to each other in different ways. So I was explaining this to somebody the other day. The husband submit, the wife submits by letting the husband be the leader. Now, First of all, it was culturally overwhelming that the husband was a leader. In fact, in those days, the, the wife belonged to the husband. When Paul said, husbands, submit to your wife, and I'll talk about that in a second, it was staggering in the context of those days. Okay? So what, what happens in that is there's two people in a marriage. You cannot vote to resolve conflict. right? If you both agree, it's wonderful. But everybody who's married knows that happens very, very seldomly. All right? So you have this different opinion, you talk about it, you discuss about it. 
One feels strongly this way, one feels strongly this way. How do we break that? Who's the oldest? Who's the tallest? Or maybe according to this question, who earns the most money? Or who has the most rewarding job? Who's, whose parent is the meaner one in the, you know? Or whose parent is the nicer one? You know, whatever. Like the one who has the, 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 one who has the mother who's the best mother-in-law gets to make, you know, all of these things. There's a lot of random things that you could do. But what the Bible says is when there needs to be a decision made, then the husband makes the decision. Yeah, and all the men go, yeah, right? And then the Bible says, and husbands, the submission comes from verse 21. You can't grammatically take it out. Husbands submit to their wives by loving their wives like Christ loved the church. So you see the beautiful balance here. The wife submits to the husband's decision. The husband makes the decisions based on what's best for the wife. There's balance there. The husband is like, I can get to decide. I can do whatever I want. No, you can do whatever is best for your wife. That's your res responsibility. Now, this gets, this gets messed up when we have this kind of situation where wives uh, have a sense of independence because they have their own careers and things like that. And especially, it is very complicated for men when their wife makes more money. You know, It is complicated because their egos are involved. And, and, and that's a really careful thing to mean to look at. Um, for some women, it gives them maybe a bigger sense of independence than is healthy. Because unfortunately, our society, our society resolves a lot of things by using money to keep score. But if a wife has a husband and she makes more money than he does, that doesn't mean that she no longer submits to him. And that doesn't mean that he no longer makes decisions based on what's best. The Bible's pattern is uh, Ephesians chapter 5, 21. Submit to one another out of reverence to Christ. Now, I've had women say, it's hard for me to submit to my husband or respect my husband because I earn more than him. And I always wonder, so for husbands who more more than their wife, that means they don't have to respect their wives and treat their wives well? No, no, no. The biblical thing is that we respect each other and submit to each other. Um, one of the things that was interesting for us when I, when I first met my wife, my wife, when she was singing, would earn more and for a big concert than, than I've ever earned in, in one whole month in my life. And so that was something I had to deal with when I first met my wife. And, and uh, she was way more famous. I wasn't famous at all. She was very famous. And in fact, I told her one time, it's kind of embarrassing. We had somebody that came into the Philippines and the wife was a singer and it was, you know, operatic and everything else. And the husband just sat there and smiled and carried bags and stuff like that. And I told my wife, I said, I'm sorry, I don't think I can do that one. I, I can't be Gigi without Dave. I can be Gigi and Dave, and I can be Dave and Gigi, but I can't just be Gigi and support staff. That was my problem. Other people can deal with it. I knew I couldn't, all right? So wives, men, you lead, but you lead in the interest of your wife. You lead for her. You make the decisions for her. You help her out in the tough times. You take the attacks to protect her. And wives, you submit to your husband because he's going to protect you when you submit to him. Does that work perfectly? Never. Does it work well? Not as often as you would hope to think. But remember, this is not 50-50. This is all in. You cannot say, well, I'll do that when he does that, or I'll do that when she does that. You have to do it no matter what. Okay? Great question. Uh, Amatine, yay. Sometimes I have doubts about Jesus. What are the ways that I can do to strengthen my faith? Can you please give advice to teens who are moving away from home for college on how to keep growing his or their faith in the new city country? All right, let me break this down. I have doubts about Jesus. That's why we call it faith. If we could resolve all of our theological questions and our faith questions intellectually, then we wouldn't need faith. All right? So somebody says to me, Pastor Dave, sometimes I just look at all of this and I ask myself, it's, does this really make sense? And my answer is, everybody goes through that, including myself. Absolutely. Every now and then I, 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 look, at, I look at faith and I say, you know, how does my faith understanding of the world compare to other understandings of the world? And when I look at that logically, I'm always happy with the result. But I need to do it every now and then. You don't always feel faithful to God. You don't always feel spiritual to God. Now, one of the things I recommend, because there's so much false information out there about Jesus, one of the things I recommend is that 
you, uh, and whether you're a teenager or whatever age, read the Gospels often. Because the center of all this is Jesus, the sacrifice that God sent. And through Jesus, what? If you've seen me, Jesus told his disciples, you've seen the Father. That's how we know the Father. And the reconciliation that comes into our lives through Jesus is to be reconciled to the Father. So read the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and go the other direction. Read the Gospels so that you understand who Jesus is. Now, the advice I would give to teens who are moving away to college. Okay, a couple of things. Number one, expect your faith to be challenged. And so be prepared to be challenged. Understand that your faith will probably not be challenged on theological grounds. I, yes, teens are smart people. They're well-educated, they're well-taught, and they go, for the most part, to very, very good universities. In fact, I think maybe some of the parents need to back off a little bit here because they're trying to force their kids to be Ivy Leaguers or, you know, whatever, and, and they think that that's the best thing for their kid, and I think you should look through it through different perspectives. But no, nobody in the modern world is going to go off to college and they hear a biology prof and they go, oh, I didn't know God did not create the world. You all know all those arguments and all those discussions already. You're going to be challenged in your faith over peer pressure and the desire to experience things that are enticing to you. That's where you're going to face your challenge. And a couple of things you need to understand. First of all, the, one of the best pieces of advice I got from my mother when I got ready to go to college, she said, Dave, remember... After, when you start college, everything you do counts towards the rest of your life. Like you do things when you're in high school, you make decisions during your high school, and they're, you know, they're pretty random, but it's okay. But college is that, is that line where you decide careers, you decide how you're going to live, you're going to decide how you respond, you decide a lot of things like that. So remember, these are important decisions. Right? That's, that's number one. Number two, don't be afraid to live your faith. It's, it's okay to let people know you're a follower of Jesus. It's okay to answer questions that they have. And it's okay for you to have questions. Don't go to people who don't know God to get spiritual input. There are a lot of wonderful people out there who can give you great social advice, great uh, school advice, great all of these other kind of advices. But if somebody doesn't believe in God, don't get spiritual advice from them. You look for people who can be spiritual mentors for you. Uh, and then uh, you need to be a part of a, some kind of a church. Now, it doesn't mean if you have to be like in a thing where you come and you gather and you sing. For most people on most campuses, being in a small group is way more effective. So when I hear, which I often do, those of you who go off to college, you think you're, you, nobody knows what's going on in your life. Are you kidding? In this age of social media and with all the IES people, everybody knows everything you do. You know, we, Somebody got home late last night. And somebody randomly showed up on a video on the, on the subway in London. That's pretty amazing. Um, anyway, make decisions about who you spend time with. You need to be in a Christian community of some type. So if, if you don't find a church that you're comfortable with, that's okay. But be involved in a small group of believers in some kind. And most schools or most university or most contexts have them. The thing about going to church is that you'll go through seasons in your life when going to church is really complicated. It's hard to find a place that you really feel that comfortable with. I remember when a group of us were in Israel and we were having an Orthodox Jew talk about his life. And he talked about all the things that they needed to do. And at sundown on Friday, all the electronic stuff went off, right? The phones went off, the TVs went off, the internet went off, everything else like that. They have all these different things they go through. And somebody said, isn't that hard? And he looked at us and he said, is it supposed to be easy to follow God? Yeah. So going to church is a really good habit. If you go to church, even when you don't like it, it's a good habit to have. But if you want to stop for a while going to an organized church, it's okay. But don't ever stop gathering with believers. Okay. Even when you don't feel like it. All right. Great questions. Let's move on. How do you explain justify God's ordained genocide of the Amalekites, including innocent children and livestock in the Old Testament? Okay, so uh, there's a couple of, of really good thoughts here uh, that we need to understand. First of all, the people who were being destroyed were very exceedingly wicked people with very wicked practices. Now, I, 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 don't, I don't remember offhand as much as I used to remember offhand. So speaking directly to the Amalekites, I'm not going to 
say that it's them specifically, but almost all of the people who occupied that particular part of the world, that land of Canaan, they practiced infant sacrifice. The Melok and also Baal, these different gods, the people would burn their oldest child in the fire just so that they would have a good harvest. God said that's wicked, and it is wicked. And that was one of the reasons that they were not supposed to mingle with these kind of people. That's one of the things that happened to them, that they, they began to pick up these traditions. If you're a follower of God, you pray for a good harvest and you trust him. And somebody would say, oh, come on, let's just burn a kid. Let's just be safe. It can't hurt, right? Yeah, except for the kid. So that's part of the reason. Uh, strategically, you cannot defeat a group of people and then leave them behind you. All right? So I was watching this, this uh, YouTube series on military, strat strat uh, military people from the British military who teach military tactics, uh, giving uh, discussions about these different Bible things. They were not believers, and they were just discussing about military tactics. And somebody said, what about this thing where they would go and destroy a group of people? And they said, well, of course. If you're going into a land and you defeat an enemy and you leave the enemy whole and intact behind you, they will kill you. Understand this. This was an issue of you destroy us or we destroy you. And so you, you, don't, you don't go there to lose. You enter into battle to win. Another thing that's really important to understand is the specific idea that there are a number of times in Scripture when it talks about totally destroying a people and that it was done where very shortly after that they talk about the remnants. And so that rhetorically, to destroy somebody and kill them all didn't necessarily mean that you were killing them all. Now, I, I, that's, that's a discussion that goes on. However, I think that we need to be very careful to not let our modern sensibilities about ancient tribes and warfare be distorted. The whole point of warfare was to either kill your enemy or enslave your enemy, neither of which was a good thing. And if you didn't kill them, they would kill you. Uh, it's a really, really tough thing. And all I try and understand is that that was a different world than the world that you and I live in. Now, there were many, many things that God told Israel. In fact, including, interestingly enough, you realize that when they were fighting their enemies, any of their enemies could stop and join them. Yeah? So one of the ways to drive out a people was to let them all become people of Yahweh, join the Hebrew nation. That was, they could do that. So it wasn't that there was no way out for these people. The way out was for them to become the people of God. Kind of interesting, yeah? So it's a really fair question. It's a really good question. Uh, it might be worthwhile. Next week, I'm going to be preaching on the most interesting question from this weekend. And we got a lot of interesting questions yesterday. This one will go up on, on one of them. I'll probably put something out there and let you all vote on which sermon it'll be. And so this, this one maybe qualifies, but it'll be a lot of Old Testament discussion too. So, In our 10 years of marriage, my husband never allows me to open his phone or computer. I don't know how much his salary is or how much money he has. What do you think? Man, oh man. Dude, what is wrong with you? I mean, seriously, you're married and you think you're supposed to have privacy on your phone or on your computer? I'm a guy... I know what privacy on your phone and computer means. Come on. How can, you, how can you share your life with somebody, be married to them, and then you say, yeah, but this is just mine alone. It's one of the weirdest ideas. Yeah, in the Bible it says the two become one flesh except for the electronic devices. <laughs> Stop it. All right? If you're doing things that you shouldn't be doing, okay, if you're doing things you shouldn't be doing, stop it. And one of the best ways to stop it is to open up access to your electronic devices. If you're not doing it, and the reason you're not, you don't allow them to is because the person who wrote this question is maybe a little bit, uh, I'm going to try and say this nicely, maybe a little bit overbearing, or maybe a little bit demanding, or maybe a little overly suspicious, all of which are things that, that can happen to any spouse, right? It's not just, oh, women are like that, men are like that too. But if that's part of the case, then you need to sit down and say, look, the honest reason that I don't ask, I don't want you to look at my phone is because I think you'll get upset about things and I might have a hard time explaining, but they are not wrong. 
And this is where you say, having an honest relationship with your spouse is more valuable than having to explain something. So just explain it. The money issue, uh, you guys probably didn't do premarital counseling with us. When you're married, it's the two of you. Now, there are a lot of different ways to handle money. And you need to have agreed on those ways or at least discussed those ways. And in a lot of situations, the, the, what belongs to the husband is the husband's, what belongs to the wife or the wife, and then what they contribute together is both of theirs. And there are a lot of different ways of doing that. But to not let them know, I, I, don't, I don't understand that. I, honestly, I can't understand it. And I can find no justifiable reason for that to happen in a Christian marriage. Secrets are dangerous in any relationships, especially in marriage. And so if you're keeping it a secret, I'm sure you have a reason. Uh, your husband, whoever this, this, this lady is, I'm sure he has a good reason. I'll take it on good faith, but it needs to stop. You need to explain why, and you need to explain what all of those things are. It's like one of the coolest things for a marriage when you can be in harmony about finances. Because finances is the number one cause of divorce in America, is finances. And it's a huge factor in every society. So don't, don't, don't try and solve that by just keeping it a secret. I'm not, I'm not, you can decide together how you spend the money, but you need to know together what's there, okay? Why is the room so quiet? Is this a bigger issue than I thought? Wow. All right. Maybe this is the preaching topic. All right. How do you encourage a believer who's disappointed with God and refuse to read the Bible, go to church, and attend a small group? Please share your wisdom. Wow. If they're a believer who doesn't go to church, doesn't read the Bible, and doesn't attend a small group, what, do they, what are they believing? I mean, seriously. Okay, first of all, I always try and ask the question, why are you disappointed with God? And usually the answer is, because God did not give me what I asked for. I'm, I'm not saying that in a pejorative sense. But often people pray and ask God for something with great and sincere hearts, and God doesn't give it to them, and they're disappointed in that. Uh, my response to that would be, number one, God knows better than you what prayers should be or should be answered and in what way they should and shouldn't be answered. So the thing that you were praying for maybe would be something that you're not, that's not what God wants you to have. And in that case, you should be thankful that God didn't give you what you prayed for. Okay, uh, quick story, if I can tell it in a quick version. The first place I ever pastored was in Hong Kong, in a church in Hong Kong. It was an international church in Hong Kong. And I always wanted to be the pastor of that church. Up until I, yes, I always thought that no matter what, 10 years, 9 years in Indonesia, the years I was in all those other places, doing the things I loved, pastoring and stuff, man, if I had a chance to go there, I... I I would go in a second. I, every time I would go to Hong Kong, I would ride this star ferry I'd, in the lower class because it's closer to the fragrant harbor, which is like a joke, you know, the, the water smells so bad there. And I would tell God, God, I'll do what you want me to do, but if you want my opinion, I should be here. And then when I asked started, I don't, I don't, have, I mean, I like to visit Hong Kong, but I, I have no interest in going there to serve as a pastor because this is the place that God prepared me for. And you were the people that God prepared you to be the people here. So he prepared us for each other. And what I thought was the best thing for my life as in terms of ministry and where I'd be, wasn't. When I was praying all those years, let me go back there. The Lord heard my prayer and said, no. So I trust him. Now, if you're disappointed, this person is disappointed, not because of that, but there are genuine things in life that happen that are disappointing and discouraging, then I think you need to do uh, be a source of comfort to them, be a friend to them, be someone that they can listen to and share their difficulties and really pray for them. But if we don't allow ourselves to engage with the word of God and the family of God and the body of Christ and the people of God, we will continue to be really disappointed. And we may never find out what God really has for us because we're stuck looking the wrong direction. Great question, by the way. Do babies who have passed away go to heaven? Are they judged by their parents' salvation? Okay, the second thing, no, there's, I wouldn't say they would be judged by their parents' salvation. That is too much of a theory of 
you're saved by the organization that you're part of, something like that. Uh, we always say God has no grandchildren. And so uh, do babies who have passed away go to heaven? In my opinion, yes. In my opinion, yes. Um, I, uh, we were talking about this the other day with our daughter because we lost a pregnancy. And, and she said, uh, I, was, I was telling her what I always tell her. I say, uh, you're my favorite child. She says, I'm your only child. And then I always say, yeah, but if I had others, you would still be my favorite. But don't tell the others. And then you know, we laugh. And then one day she said, if I go to heaven, do I have a sibling in heaven? I think so. Then she can't. I said, don't tell the sibling that you are my favorite. You know? But do I think so? Yeah, I really do believe that at some place, God, God has a body and a soul and a spirit and a personality that are together. And if that person is never born, they still exist. One of the issues for this is for, it's really hard for you and I to separate ourselves from thinking that value comes from health or success or learning or intelligence or something like that. And, and so we, we say, oh yeah, that wouldn't be the way. And now, now I'm not saying theologically, I can't prove it or anything else. But we, we say, well, a person who was never be born, so they're never born, so they never really have a personality. All of you who have had children in a womb that you were relating to either as a mother or a parent, you know, the cool thing that you do when, when you're pregnant and you put your hand on the stomach and you feel somebody moving around in there and all that, all of you have had that experience. No, there's somebody there. And their personality comes through. It really does. So then we understand that why wouldn't they be in eternity, okay? And we need to look at all the people in this world as having equal value to God. God doesn't value people on, on, on whether they're smart or whether they are well-educated or, or, you know, our world is struggling with a lot of things. We had a lot of discussion about this in our drive-in this morning about people who face different kinds of physical challenges. Um, in Iceland, uh, two or three years ago, the government mandated that all pregnant women are required to have a genetic workup of their child. And the government doesn't require that they do anything, but the government is insisting that they know whether a child would be born with certain kinds of, of physical problems or things like that. And, and in the years since they've passed that law, there have been no children born with Down syndrome. And the people who have Down syndrome who, and their children who have Down syndrome are really upset. And they're saying the implication that the government is saying and the implication of society is that their children have no right to live. And those who have Down syndrome, because we've, we've since learned that many with Down syndrome can, can accomplish quite a few things. They're upset because you're, they're saying, you, what you're saying is we're not as human. I think they have a really, really good argument. There are a lot of different issues that people face in the world. Those of us who happen to not face some of the obvious physical, mental, or even social struggles should never, never, ever, ever consider that God sees us with favor. The part of us that's made in the image of God, that's why we're precious, and all, every single human who's, who, and all the humans are made in the image of God. They're all precious to God. And so they would, yes, they would go to heaven. All right. Ethically speaking, what is my opinion on euthanasia in this situation of unbearable pain? I believe that euthanasia at, at, in those situations should be the decision of the person involved. I, 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 as a pastor, my position on euthanasia is this. I would want a person who is not, does not know Jesus to stay alive until they find a way to receive Jesus. Uh, that's why, ethically, I'm against the death penalty. Uh, horrible, horrible people, I would prefer uh, that they stay alive and have a chance to follow Jesus. Just reading on the Manson killers, you know, Charles Manson, Helter Skelter, uh, uh, what's her name? Something Van something. She just got out of jail, 53 something years. Now, I don't know about her, but I do know that Tex Watson, who was one of the savage, brutal people, he became a follower of Jesus Christ and a number of the other Manson, Manson uh, cult did. So people would say, well, they should have all been executed. Well, I understand that from a legal 
you know, ethical point of view, but I also understand that because they weren't executed, they had a chance to learn to follow Jesus. So if a person is a follower of Jesus and they make a decision to do euthanasia, I understand it, and I think it's a decision that they need to make. Now, because of what I do, I have been with a number of different people when decisions were made about extending life. Now, it's not something I do all the time, but it is something I, I do. And, and I believe that I'm there to comfort the family as they deal with it and to also be with the person as they go. But I also believe that it's really important for me to try and make sure that the decisions that a person might have. So if someone were to come to me and say, I'm in unbearable pain, I want to end my life. First of all, I, I need to know legally what's acceptable. And in Indonesia, euthanasia of all forms is not allowed. There's also a difference between an active, an active euthanasia and a person letting a person die. I've told my, my wife and my daughter over and over and over and over again, no matter what happens to me at what stage of my life, do not extend my life for the sense of extending my life. So if something happens to me and I, and I, I say, I, you know, I go into a coma and they say, yeah, we can keep him alive, but he's not ever going to get better. I, I don't want that. If I can't breathe on my own, don't put a tube down my, you know. Now, if, if you're going to be in a situation where you're going to say, oh, yeah, if you do this and help him breathe, tomorrow he'll be able to breathe on his own. And I'm, and I'm still, my mind is still functioning. Yeah, go for it. But I don't, I don't want a machine. So euthanasia is the active thing. I think that's the most critical. However, a person who is un, in unbearable pain, I certainly understand and I would not criticize their decision. But I would want to, if involved in that situation, I would want to make sure that they are making the, the decision in light of the best understanding of their own relationship with God and their own surrendering of their life to him. Is that, that's, yeah, I hope that's clear. If it's not, somebody else put a question up. Okay, what is your opinion on Benny Hinn's ministry and other Word of Faith ministries? Okay, Word of Faith ministry came into the church because there was a, there was a lack of teaching of getting people to believe and, and so in that lack of, of, of something that's important, then uh, an extortion or distortion of that became important. So the word of faith is kind of this idea that, you know, we somehow are the ones who activate God's faith. A lot of the origins of it are, are really quite ungodly. And the idea is, you know, God spoke everything into it. So words have creative power. So when we issue a word of faith, oh, come on, that's, that's, that's not biblical at all. Now, responding to an individual like this, let me just say, I have decided not to do that anymore. Because when you ask me about a particular person, um, I, I, don't mind, uh, I don't mind talking about what people believe and what they put into practice, but it's, it's too personal for me to attack him personally. So I, I won't respond to that. But Word of Faith Ministries, uh, those kind of things where you, know, you create God's miracles or you know, uh, you, you, uh, uh, if you pray in this certain way, God has to answer it or, you know, all of those kinds of things. God wants everybody to be rich. God wants everybody to be healthy. Uh, those are, those don't make any sense. They're not the gospel. They're not the good news. They're not biblical. Uh, they're attractive. Uh, I wish I, I wish I could, I wish I could convince you all of some of those things, but I can't because I answer some to somebody else besides you. And, and so, you know, so that would be my answer. Uh, no comment on a person and their personality. They, they answer to the Lord. I answer to the Lord. They don't answer to me, and I don't answer to them. Word of faith, no. no. It's not even close. Do we have faith? Yes. Where is our faith? Our faith is in God. You hear some of these guys say, you have to have faith in faith. That's idolatry. Word of faith is a form of idolatry. Word of, word of uh, uh, like blessing and positive life, that's a form of idolatry. We don't do those things. Okay, good. Great question. By a 10-year-old, okay, why doesn't Jesus want to come down to earth right now and end all the bad things happening? You know what? That's a really good question. And you know what the answer is? Jesus does want to come down to earth right now. But his father has a plan and purpose that's going to be fulfilled. And some of the bad things that are happening are going to be made good. And so the, that God is waiting for that time. Um, there's a scripture that says, God is not slack as some understand slackness. 
So God is not lazy or late or uh, anything else like that in some way that some people think. God is not willing that any should perish. And it's, it's about the referral of the promise of Jesus coming back, but that all would come to repentance. And so we need to understand that one of the many reasons that God has not sent his son into the world and called, stop, it's time for judgment, is because he wants more people to be entered into a relationship with him and to be forgiven which says to us that if that's what he's about, that's what we need to be about as well. We need to be making sure that more people have an opportunity to know Jesus. Really good question and very good from a 10-year-old. So that's one of the reasons I like having the the 10-year-olds in here. All right. As a Christian parent, how should we guide our children regarding their views on LGBTQ+. I think there's a plus missing. should be plus plus, right? Uh, Is it possible to start a ministry for people struggling uh, with LGBT issues here in IES. Okay, two good questions. First of all, as a parent, and this is really important, allow your children to ask questions and have a good dialogue with them. Don't ever be afraid of the questions that they ask. Answer every question that they ask at every age. However, at certain ages, there might be answers that might be uh, inappropriate for them to have it expressed. So there are some times when you might, they might say, well, what about like something or other? And you'll say, well, you know, that's not something that a seven-year-old should know about. So when you're a little bit older, we can talk about that. But when they talk about LGBTQ plus issues, listen to what they have to say and then affirm to them that God loves everybody, that the church loves everybody, but we're not going to say that certain things that the Bible tells us should not be done it's okay to do them. What does the Bible tell us? Uh, these are all issues of sex, right? What does the Bible tell us about it? That sex is something that God created for a man and a woman who are married to each other. And it is exists for that purpose because within that context, it has this extreme value, all right? Any sex outside of that is inappropriate. It's wrong. It's using, it, it's sin, okay? But we're not saying that word. I mean, like if, I, if I'm supposed to forgive somebody and I don't forgive somebody, I'm sinning. So let's make it clear, okay? We all sin. But those kind of issues, we want, we want our children to grow up understanding this is why we believe. And so it's important for us to, to explain our understanding of all of these, and these are multiple issues. It's way more complicated now because people have been told whatever you feel identifies you. And you feel many different things through your life, right? And so that's what makes it really complicated. But listen to them, have an understanding with them. We have at different times had a lot of different ministries that minister to people with, uh, especially with same-sex attractions, but with people who understand different things. Right now, we don't have a active sort of group that's identifiable because for many different reasons, and one of them is a lot of people who are kind of dealing with those things I don't want it to be identified like, you know, uh, okay, we're, uh, on Saturday, everybody who's struggling with, you know, some kind of a thing, show up down here and we'll talk. And eh, it doesn't really work that way. But we have, I have a lot of people. And look, uh, these are issues that are, we face in the world. And your kids face them. And they will be taught things that you don't want them to accept and believe. So listen and, and give them answers. If you have questions you don't understand, please contact. Please contact. We, I'm really happy to deal with a lot of this. Good. Okay, we're down to a few more questions, yeah. Why did Pastor Mike leave? Is he really coming back? Oh, that's a good question. Okay, so uh, all of us, or most of us who are in IES that serve in ministry uh, function in a number of different roles. So I've been the pastor of IES for the last 25 years, almost, well. And in that time, I've also served at different, uh, I have different roles within the Great Jasidak Jamar Ali, the Indonesia. I am a... I am an advisor to the uh, Badan Pengurus Pusat. I've served in roles within the uh, Assemblies of God Foreign Missions Department in Indonesia, or in Southeast Asia, and all these different things, and all these interlapping roles. And within these roles, there are certain things that you do and you go to to be placed in positions to have a greater impact. So Pastor Mike, during the time he was here, Pastor Mike was ordained before they came. So from that organizational of the Assemblies of God of the USA... Uh, he was clearly qualified. And then within the, uh, the um, uh, Assemblies of God of Indonesia, he is recognized on that qualification as being a part of things here. 
However, within the organization of the missions department of the USA, which is one of the other sort of mixing things together, there are some organizational steps that he needs to take. Some, 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 uh, you might, I don't know what you would even call them, some organizational things that he needs to do. And one of the things in that is he needs to spend a, a, a period of time traveling to churches within the Pacific Northwest and sharing with them the ministry that he does here. So Mike and Shelley are completely committed to Indonesia and to being involved in, I, I, in, involved in international church ministry, whether it would be in IES or whether it would be not in IES. That's their commitment. And that's what they're fulfilling now. It is their plan to come back. But we all, we all know that, I, you know, I can't say 100% that they'll definitely be back. But it is their plan to come back. And he, uh, they are going through those structural organizational steps so that he will be he will have another acknowledgement of role in ministry. Okay, so that's the easiest way for me to explain it. And if they don't do that, then certain doors of ministry would not be open for them. And so that's, that's part of that answer. All right. What is my favorite VeggieTales song? Um, keep walking, but you won't knock down, our, knock down our walls. Keep walking if you think they're going to fall. It seems to me your brains are very small to think walking will knock down our wall, something like that. That's the Veggie Tale song about Joshua, and it's where the children of Israel are walking around Jericho, and they're making fun of them and insulting them. I love that line. It seems to me your brains are very small. I, I just love that line. That's a really good line. That's my favorite Veggie Tale song. My favorite color is blue. So I think that's my daughter's question. So She should have to pay me when she asks those questions. Last question. Okay, here we go. What's your plan for retirement? Are you really going to retire? Yes. All right, I hope everybody understands this, okay? As you know, it's my birthday today. I am turning 68. I determined in my heart with prayer and thought and asking the Lord that when I, when I turn 70, I am no longer the pastor of IES, all right? So two years from now, when the day's over, I'm not the IES pastor anymore. And somebody said to me, oh, Pastor Dave, but what if we haven't found a pastor? Will you stay on? And I said, no, absolutely not. Okay, the worst thing that a pastor can do for their church is to say that they're going to leave, but don't pick a date, and then just keep saying, oh, I, I don't think it's ready yet. It's not really, I'm not quite ready yet. It's the absolute worst thing. Statistically, if you look at all the problems that they have in, in, in churches, in transitions, okay? I'm not going to do that. I felt like Eight years ago, I asked the Lord, Lord, do you have anything for me to do? And I felt like of all the opportunities that I had and all the different things, the only thing I really wanted to do was to be the pastor of IES. And so I, that's what I've chosen. It, and I'm really happy with my choice. However, it's not a good thing for me to stay too long. It's just not a good thing. It's not good for you. It's not good for me. Uh, I love you guys. Well, I love most of you. Yeah. And... Um, I, I, want, I want the ending of my time to be your pastor to be, you know, I want people to be saying, oh, man, I wish Pastor Dave could have stayed on for a little bit longer. Uh, instead of saying, at last. <laughs> and so uh, it is complicated for us. Uh, you know, my wife is uh, like about 30 years younger than me. And so she's not ready to retire. But, you know, uh, we're, we're in this together. So when I go, she goes. For those of you who are thinking about asking her to be the next pastor, it's not going to work, okay? She's going, yes, I'm going to retire. I'm going to go back to the States. Um, I plan to stay active as a Christian. I feel like I have some experiences and some things like that that might be valuable for some people. I've had an opportunity in the States. I've got some good friends who pastor the churches that we might call uh, every tribe, every, every tongue churches where people come in in a mix like that. They would look like this. I want to be involved with some of them. And there are some things that are possible that people have said, can you help with this? You can help with this. I'm not going somewhere else to do ministry. I'm going to be in Seattle, in that area. And uh, my wife and I may make an occasional trip someplace where we might do ministry, but that is, we're leaving that open as a possibility, but we're not going anyplace else. If I had enough energy to be full-time pastoring a church, I would just stay here. But that's just not the right way for it to go. So uh, we're going to retire, and, and uh, that will be in two years from now. And uh, we're just, my plan is to just live in where we live 
We're going to live on the east side of the city of Seattle, and probably in the town of Newcastle, but someplace over there. And um, just think of you all fondly and get ready to go to Seahawks games with some of you when you come through, especially if it's San Francisco. Yeah, Gary and Frida. So they came to Seattle and visited us. They went to a Seahawks game without us. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. And, and, and Seattle won, though, right? It's a great experience, yeah. So we hope some of you will come and visit us. Uh, I, 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 I have a place when we go to the States and visit, and I have a place where I go have coffee preparing for when I'm an old man sitting there like all the other old men. That'll be many years from now. But anyway, look, we love, we love this church, and we love you guys. And, and it's, we're, we're doing this out of our love for you. So please don't misunderstand me. If I was 15 years younger and had the energy, I would just, I wouldn't retire yet. I would wait 15 years instead of two. But everything's going to be okay. You're a, you're, this is a good church. You have good leaders at every level, and you'll find a new lead pastor, and it'll be the right person the Lord brought in. Everything's going to be fine. It'll be different. That's fine, too. I mean, even IES is different at different times, right? All right. Thank you for all your wonderful questions. I think there might still be cake, though I did see some people sneaking out, and some of those other people came in early. Would you all stand to your feet and let me pray for you? Wonderful Father in heaven, I thank you for, for this really good group of people. I thank you for those who are uh, asking sincere questions, Lord. I thank you for those who are participating in this way, and I pray that there might be people who heard things that had nothing to do with the questions they have, and yet they sparked things in their heart. So I pray that your hand would be upon them and watch over them. Father, I, I thank you for all of the children who are here, a 10-year-old and even younger. I pray that the things that they hear and learn would also draw, draw them, allow them to be closer to you. May we always remember, Lord, that we are responsible as stewards for everything that you give us. It includes our personal lives. It includes our marriages. It includes our children. and includes the children of IES as well. May we always bring joy to you as your children. I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you all. Have some cake. God bless you all.